Hello everyone and welcome back to New Horizons, where we continue our mission for Epoxy to create cheaper circuits. So we started off with some base expansion last episode, clearing out some space behind the walls of the valley, extending out the wiring tunnels and walkways and making space for future technology. The first of the rooms to be built last episode was our petrochemistry and oil processing facility, since one of the initial steps for Epoxy is propene. Obtained from a complex web of oil processing that we managed to navigate our way through last episode, we set up various chemical reactors, oil cracking units, and distillation towers. And it took a number of attempts to get it the way we want it, but honestly I'm really happy with the way it came out. And now that the colour has been changed from blue to yellow, I think I'm liking this room even more. I really doubted that yellow would work, but actually it does, right? And the blue colour is of course reserved for the fluid storage room, which I've been also been working on here between episodes. And we're just about ready for the first full-scale test of this system. However, all of the machines we crafted were very expensive, and it wiped out a lot of our raw materials, most of which we're going to have to think about replacing sooner rather than later, especially given the fact that we don't have robust ore processing. And not to mention that everything in Greg Tech New Horizons costs you an arm and a leg. So yeah, the first job for today is to go out and collect the miners. So with the miners collected, I went back to the base and immediately started to process down a lot of the urgent materials. Things like stainless steel, redstone and copper. And then I noticed we were also short on things like energetic and vibrant alloy. We start to use those materials more and more frequently. But with a lot of the materials processing, there's still one very important thing which we're missing. <laughs> you know what, that's not the first time that's happened. That happened during one of the live streams as well, these guys right outside the front door. Yeah, those creepers man, those creepers. Anyways, what we're actually missing here is mica. And if you guys have seen the previous episodes then you'll know that uh, mica is used in basically all the multi-blocks, especially the LCRs. And mica is also one of the most rare veins you can find. I think still the best place to find it is the overworld. But so far I think we're only aware of this mica vein over here, and I believe I've mined all of that out. It's been a while since I've been over this side of the map actually. I wonder if that sheep is still here, in the quicksand? Oh yeah he is! <laughs> Do you guys remember this guy from like episode, I don't know, 6 or 7? And now there's two! Anyways, let's see if we- oh! No way! Did that actually just happen? Did we just find him? <laughs> I was expecting to be out here for at least an hour, or like 30 minutes maybe, I don't know. I cannot believe that just happened. I'm certainly not complaining, that's for sure. Um, Yeah, I guess we're gonna have to go back and get the miner. When I went to collect them earlier, I realised this one hadn't finished, it just filled the chests. I think we hit a particularly massive coal vein, and that gave us a lot of output. So yeah, this thing should be running, but I'm going to stop it if it's just coal. Yeah, it's almost full again. We Like, there's no way we need this much coal. And we definitely need mica ASAP. Alright, so we're here at the mica vein. All we have to do now is set up the ore drilling plant. Not exactly the easiest thing to move around and build every time, but it's for sure the most efficient method that we have right now. And at some point pretty soon we'll probably up look at upgrading this and maybe also getting a second one. That's probably not going to be viable though until we get at least some form of ore processing. Because we are collecting ores way faster than we can actually process any of this stuff. But yeah, to get epoxy we're going to have to get mica. There's no question about that. And there's also something I kept from you guys last episode. It's a, it's a little secret which I probably shouldn't have done but uh, it got us through. Let me build this first. Okay, I think all we have to do now is the maintenance, and it should turn on. I'm going to verify everything is working correctly. It should be in order though, as long as we enable automatic output from the mixer. And as soon as the miner gets down to depth, we should start to pull up some mica. I'm going to come back to check on this in a couple of hours. We make sure it's chunk loaded. We have plenty of other things to be doing right now. I cannot- oh wait, we found basalt here as well. You know what, I'm going to grab this. We always need this for building. Looks like it's a pretty small vein though, unfortunately. 
<laughs> yeah, that's awesome that we managed to find that so quickly. And we'll have one more compressed chest to add to our collection. Look at all this stuff. So if you guys were really paying attention last episode, you might have noticed some of the EBF coils appearing out of nowhere. Well, it actually wasn't out of nowhere. It was from this EBF right here for titanium. Fortunately, we do have quite a lot of titanium. There's 800 in this drawer. Plus we have, I don't know how much rutile still left in those chests. And I believe there's some in the AE system still. Oh yeah, like almost 700. Yeah, almost 1500 total titanium, which is really not too bad for this point in the game. So we can definitely afford to, to borrow those coils, but we definitely want to replace those. One of the many reasons we need mica. Anyways, that is enough about mica. I want to come back to our oil distillation room over here. So yeah, as I mentioned, I did actually manage to get all the, all of the filters set here. And we're almost ready for the first large scale test. And I think with the exception of two fluids, we have pretty much everything stored here. The refinery gas, the sulfuric acid, the toluene. This one is empty. Yeah, ethylene, ethane, all of this stuff. Propane, butadiene, butene. <laughs> all of this stuff we're going to use eventually. And I'm looking for this one right here for naphtha. So naphtha, I'm actually not sure what we should do with at the moment. So just as a quick recap, what we're doing here is we're taking raw oil. Raw oil is distilled into the sulfuric versions. One of those being sulfuric naphtha, which goes into the LCR. And that is reacted with hydrogen, which comes from the fluid P2P, to turn it into regular naphtha. And then the regular naphtha we have going into fluid storage, which is the tank we just seen. And also into the second oil cracker here to turn it into moderately steam cracked naphtha here. But with the configuration that we have here, since we're inputting raw oil into the system, raw oil actually gives us 1500 litres of naphtha for every 1000 litres of oil, compared with just 100 heavy fuel, 500 light fuel, and 600 sulfuric gas. So basically we end up with a disproportionate amount of naphtha, which is the reason why we have the naphtha tank. However, we don't actually store light fuel, heavy fuel, or sulfuric gas, refinery gas. Those are just directly fluid P2P'd from the output bus straight into the oil cracking unit. Actually, wait, we do store sulfuric gas. Or refinery gas, yeah. And actually, if we can find refinery gas here. Here, refinery gas. I think we actually just want to void overflow. Then it goes through the system into the final distillation tower over here. And it looks like I didn't actually link this P2P. So all we have to do is find the input P2P. As far as possible, by the way, I tried to make the inputs at fluid storage. And the input P2P actually does matter when it comes to fluid P2P. I think we want to bind this one, right? That should send all the naphtha from here. Yeah, perfect. Uh, on all of these tanks, by the way, we have some pumps to send them into the fluid P2P. And we should now see some more naphtha in the tank over here. But yeah, as far as possible, I wanted to make the input P2P frequency this one here or the one on these tanks, because if the input is broken on the frequency, then all of the other fluid P2Ps on the same frequency will be destroyed. Or not destroyed, but uh, unlinked, and you have to go and find them manually. And Naphtha is this one, right? Yeah, I believe that is more than what we had. And I just realized we're also missing fluid storage for methane, and also propene, which is the, the whole reason we set this up. So as soon as we set this methane tank right here, we should see the distillation towers turn on. Let's bind this frequency. Is this going to work? Oh my goodness, look at that. Perfect. <laughs> that is perfect. Perfection, awesome. Yeah, and it's six seconds for each recipe. All we have to watch out for is the maintenance issues. And also to connect these tanks again. This one is turned off. I wonder why that is. Maybe he's no inputs. Oh yeah, look at that. We're a little bit short on heavy fuel. I think that's the one we get the least off at the first process down there. So I guess that they won't all be running at the same time. So yeah, the other thing I mentioned was actually the power situation over here. And for the moment, since we don't have distributed power, all I've done is actually set up a tank of benzene here, which is fed to all the gas turbines for these machines. This thing will eventually be replaced. Okay, we actually just crashed there, and I mean the full server just crashed. And I have a feeling it's because I tried to open the super tank through the catwalk. So I uh, <laughs> definitely be careful of that. But we seem to be okay here. Yeah, nothing seems to be broken now that I've restarted. So yeah, I'm going to spend some time over here just to make sure everything is working the way we want it. Everything seems to be in order, though. We also get the sulfuric acid from here, along with the distillation tower outputs. All right, so we cut to around 45 minutes later, and things are working perfectly here, almost a little bit too flawlessly. 
But I realized it doesn't actually make any sense to store naphtha here. So I'm going to remove this tank. There's no other, there's no reason to buffer it here since we don't need it elsewhere in the base. So that only creates a bigger buffer here before the machines stop anyway. And I didn't consider the fact that naphtha, when we distill it in the final process over here, also gives us some more light and heavy fuel. So it kind of makes up the difference. So yeah, for the time being, sulfuric gas is actually the only thing we void out of this. And the rest seems to just work itself out once all the machines run. <laughs> I'm actually very pleased with how this system turned out. Alright everyone, so it's time to make the final sprint towards epoxy. And all of this, the automation with the chemicals and things, especially when you have uh, fluid movement capabilities like what we have, and a basic applied energistic system, power is still an issue, but uh, we can kind of get around that using gas turbines. And we'll be addressing power in the next couple of episodes. But yeah, setting up all this is definitely my favourite way to play this game. And ironically enough, one of the things I struggled the most with actually when I started to play Greg Tech. So, I want to take you guys through how I actually design all of these systems. So, uh, instead of a building with three, call this a uh, chemistry with three. So yeah, hopefully some of you can get some positive value out of uh, what we're about to go over. I did go and collect the mica, by the way, for the Cooper Nickel coils. Since uh, what we need to do is set up some LCRs. And I think there's also one electrolyzer that belongs in this process. So whenever I'm designing a chemical line, the first step is always to think about what machines you need. So if we familiarize ourselves with the epoxy recipe again, often for chemicals in Gregtech there is multiple different routes you can take. For example, we have this one, both of these chemical reactor recipes make us molten epoxid. One is a circuit 24 recipe and generally you always want to pick the circuit 24. Both of these recipes give us 1000 litres of epoxy and 2000 litres of salt water, but the circuit 24 recipe actually bypasses the need to make bisphenol A. Since to make bisphenol A you need hydrochloric acid, acetone and phenol, but that is actually just included in the recipe here. And then on top of that you just add in the sodium hydroxide and the epichlorohydrin, here and here. So using circuit 24 is generally a good idea always and this is the one we'll go for. And this approach might not work for everyone, but at least for me, I think it helps working backwards. So I like to start with epoxy and then work our way back through phenol, through hydrochloric acid, through epichlorohydrin, and then go through those materials and figure out if we need to automate those alongside epoxy. And I think for at least four of those materials, that is the case. So we are gonna need four large chemical reactors. One, two, three, four. An electrolyzer, which I think we're gonna craft at MV. We're missing some wire. Okay, MV electrolyzer. But still we have to figure out how many fluids exactly we're dealing with here. Since all of the fluids are going to need their own dedicated inputs and outputs, which we actually have a lot of. Nice. So along with the epoxy, we have to make hydrochloric acid, which itself is two inputs, one output. We have to make acetone. And to make acetone, we need acetic acid. So that's two more uh, chemical reactors right there. Oh yeah, it's two more chemical reactors. We actually need five LCRs total. There we go. Then after we establish how many fluids we're dealing with, I like to lay it out in a little uh, Word document or sometimes in game with signs, where we start with the recipes up here. So we start with epoxy and epichlorohydrin. I also like to group them in how we're gonna lay out the machines as well. So epoxy, as we know, is three input hatches for fluids, one input bus, circuit number 24, and that is gonna equal two output fluids. And then the minimum tier of the epoxy recipe is LV. And for now, we'll run them all at LV. Now all we need to do is count the hatches and craft every- It's been a while. It's been a while, clean room. That doesn't belong there. No, it doesn't belong there. <laughs> I'm trying to craft here.
All right, so I think we're ready to get cracking here. Wait, no, not get cracking. These things are cracking. These things are reacting. Yeah. <laughs> we're ready to start reacting. Okay, so first of all, I realized we are going to need some more fluid storage. Wait, is that a, regener is that a regenerating enderman? A sickly enderman. I, I don't want a sick enderman. Uh, yeah, I think I've mentioned this before, but, but we lost our enderman that we used to have in the smellery. I think all we have to say is accidents happen. I'm just going to leave it up to your imagination. Anyways, I realized we're actually short on space for fluid storage. We'll have to add chlorine, which we have here. And that is going to go right here. Make sure we have the settings on the tank. And then we can give the fluid P2P a name so that we can recall it down at the LCRs. We also are going to need space for hydrochloric acid, so I guess we can name this one. And we'll also need- we're dying here. We are- we need terawatt. Make sure all these tanks are locked as well, right? Yeah. We also need to create one for phenol, and then also one for molten epoxid. Uh, we're going to call it- yeah, we'll call it by its proper name, epoxid. And for phenol, we actually get phenol from the benzene system over here. Here, which we're going to hook up to Applied Energistics, we're just going to grab the full tank since we'll be requesting this fluid and eventually this will, will be connected to fluid storage. We just have to send an Applied Energistics connection over here. But I don't think that's going to live there long term. So I'm a little reluctant to do that right now. For the moment, we'll just fill the phenol tank and this should be ready to go once we start to link all these P2Ps together. Yeah, and we've given it chlorine. The hydrochloric acid will make. Perfect. So now we're going to work backwards. So it's going to be epoxid, epichlorohydrin, acetic acid, acetone, no, acetone, acetic acid, hydrochloric acid. So for all of these, actually what we're going to do is have the output hatches on the bottom and we'll try to keep it as consistent as we can. So all the output hatches will, will go down here. And this way we can easily set our fluid detector covers here, 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 pointing it into the machine controllers. We need machine controller covers on the machine controller. And then all of these will be set to a bucket. Yeah, a bucket inverted and then enable with redstone. And you guys all know the golden rule by now, right? Redstone on, machine on. Yeah, and of course we have to remember about safe mode and we'll invert all these covers. Okay, so now we're going to have the maintenance hatches on the top of the LCRs. Remember, these things can actually go anywhere. All of the input buses and hatches. Something that's non-negotiable though is the PTFE pipe casing must go behind the controller. And then we'll have the coil blocks on... Actually, we can share these coil blocks, right? We can put them in the middle of the wall shared LZRs. So these three will be wall shared. Then we'll have a space in the middle. And then the last two will also be wall shared. Yeah, and we actually save two coils doing it that way. Then we'll also have all the energy hatches on the back. And then gas turbines connect... Oh, I didn't make enough gas turbines. We're missing three. So yeah, we're actually most of the way there now. All we have to do is the input hatches. And there's also input buses. I counted three, but since we're actually wall sharing these two machines, we can get away with one. And we can just share the input bus since the inputs for our epoxy... Yeah, epoxid and epichlorohydrin is sodium hydroxide dust. And this is fully recyclable as well. I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. But yeah, this is going to go in the middle. And then it's just all the input hatches, which we counted out earlier. And yeah, it's going to look something like this. I actually moved the energy hatches to the bottom middle. That allows us to put the gas turbines underneath and then run Fluix cable up the back to feed the fluid inputs. And yeah, we're like 80% there by now. All we have to do is fill in the casings to complete all the multi-block structures. Hopefully I crafted enough. I didn't actually count this. I just kind of crafted like a stack and a half and hopefully it's going to be enough here. Again, this is a, always a variable number. It kind of just depends how many hatches and if you wall shear or not. All right, so now all we need to do is hook up the fluid inputs. And we have some decisions to make here. We are looking for oil 2 here. Oil 2 right here. Yeah, we need some applied energistics connections first. And it was pointed out to me that actually dense ME conduit, this is basically equivalent to the dense smart cable. This is actually way cheaper to produce. It does take some titanium, but if you compare that to the smart cable, this is uh, HV circuits for four and energetic alloy, which I was preparing for, but uh, I mean, if we can get around the circuit cost at this point, 
especially before epoxy, then yeah, we're gonna use these dense cables or these dense conduits. And then I think we'll run it up the middle here and then split it off to each side. Okay, so now that the LCRs are built, let's actually go from top to bottom. And at this point in the build, there's potential for some of the placements of the hatches to be moved. I can already see one that's gonna be changed. But yeah, let's start with the hydrochloric acid, which is in the first LCR. This is gonna be hydrogen plus chlorine. And there's multiple ways to get hydrochloric acid. We get it as a byproduct from many different chemical processes. As you can see here, there's 25 recipes, 25 pages of recipes. We get it from like PVC, we get it from PTFE. Well, we're just gonna make sure that we have a dedicated process for it here. So yeah, all we have to do here is hook up the P2P, convert them to fluid, search for chlorine, which we set up earlier, and bind. And the other one we want to search for hydrogen, which we also have in fluid storage, right here. So now this one is linked, output side, linked output side. We should see chlorine, perfect. We should see hydrogen, oh my goodness. <laughs> this is exciting. I don't know why I get excited at stuff like this, I just do. And, and then we also need a, a circuit number, right? Yes, yeah, circuit, program circuit one. And then there's also the output hatch, which also has to receive a fluid P2P. And that should send all the hydrochloric acid into main storage. On second thought though, yeah, see, this is where things get a little bit complicated because we do actually get hydrochloric acid from making an epichlorohydrin, which is this chemical reactor here. And we want to use all of this one first before it makes any fresh from uh, chlorine plus hydrogen. So how do we ensure that we do that? I'm actually not sure there's a way to do fluid priorities. Yeah, as far as I know, there's no way to actually do this here, but I think I might have a bit of an idea. Yeah, let's actually hold that thought. We'll, we'll disconnect this for now, right? This is gonna be set up for when we need it, but we'll come back to this at the end. I have an idea, trust me. <laughs> Something that is not gonna work though is the placement of this Cooper Nickel coil right here. I don't think you can have two on the same LCR, so this one has to go on the end here. No big deal. This should form the multi-block though, right? Yeah, and allow us to hook up the next LCR, which is going to be for acetic acid. Again, a few different ways to get acetic acid. The way I've chosen to go, though, is ethylene plus oxygen. You can also go methanol carbon monoxide or carbon monoxide hydrogen. It basically all just boils down to hydrogen oxygen. Yeah, same as before, we can import oxygen and ethylene. And ethylene, remember, we make actually right here. We make out of the distillation towers. <laughs> all right, and we have ethylene plus oxygen, plus circuit number nine, I think. Yep, circuit number nine. And this one definitely is gonna go into main fluid storage. Down here. We didn't have a frequency for acetic acid, so I went ahead and assigned one over at main fluid storage. And we should now be able to connect to that here. In order to get all this running and test the system as we, as we build it, I'm actually gonna create a fresh fluid P2P here. And this one we're going to link up to benzene, which we are also making out of the distillation tower up there. And for the moment, before we have energy cables to supply the machines themselves, we're actually going to supply the gas turbines here with benzene. Oh, I forgot these things connect to everything. Oh yeah, look at that. It's because of the green channel. That's why you never use green channel. <laughs> because this is actually pushing into the conduit and green is always enabled for some reason on the fluid conduit. It's a, it's a very annoying feature, but if you can call it a feature. But yeah, we'll set brown insert on all the gas turbines and that gives them all benzene. No explosions yet, everything should be LV here. And actually that acetic acid LCR should have turned on by now because we have the machine controller. All right, we should be making acetic acid out of this thing. Yep, I, I saw it for a brief second. <laughs> nice. You know what, we're gonna stop this for now because uh, that's gonna fill a full super tank. And I don't think we wanna use all of that ethylene for acetic acid at this very moment in time. But we probably will though, because this will be running for many hours before we actually need ethylene. So yeah, the next one here is acetone, which uses acetic acid, circuit 24, and calcium dust. So calcium dust we've been making for many episodes over here at Benzene. And in fact, I think we have hundreds of stacks of this stuff somewhere. Yeah, look at that, 800, st <laughs> 800 stacks of calcium. However, I believe in the update we're in, it actually doesn't even consume calcium in the process. So we only need one dust for this. <laughs> and that one dust is gonna go in the input bus. 
I'm actually going to point this away just to so it looks a bit nicer on the top. And then we just have to recall the acetic acid, which we're making here. And the reason we send it back to fluid storage and then back here is because we need acetic acid elsewhere. It's also used in vinyl acetate, which is something I made last episode for that glue. Oh, every time this works, I'm uh, it puts a smile on my face to see this. That means we actually did make the right fluid here as well, because I didn't actually verify it. But yeah, it looks like we are getting acetic acid. Okay, we have a very slight mistake here. <laughs> this actually has to be an HV LCR. We need an HV energy hatch and also an HV gas turbine. Fortunately, we do have some spare. Okay, so we got the LCR switched to HV and it also gives us CO2 gas, which I actually configured in main fluid storage. And we're just going to make sure to overflow void any excess. CO2 gas, I recall we do need for something. I think it might be this. And we also need it for methanol and carbon monoxide if we want to make this. Yeah, we need it in a few different places, so we want to make sure not to void that. We'll just give it its own fluid storage. And before we do that, actually, we have to make use of the locking feature, which we have on this desulfurizing LCR, because acetic acid or acetone actually gives us three outputs, only two of which we want to keep. The water we just want to void. So what we're going to do to ensure that is run the recipe once. We'll add a temporary output hatch here. If we run this recipe once, 20 seconds. Yeah, it's, it's kind of slow, but I believe these ones over here are like 30 seconds each. We can deal with slow at this point in the game because these things are going to be passive, meaning that they are basically going to be running all the time. And yeah, that's what I was afraid of. The acetone got put in the top and we got water in the bottom and CO2 gas in this one. So to make sure the water is the one that's voided, what we're actually going to do is take out the, the acetone and lock it into the bottom one. Only acetone can appear here. We'll have to take the water out. And then, of course, we'll lock the CO2 gas into this output hatch. So this is the only gas that can appear here. And then water has nowhere to go. So as we know with the multi-blocks, it does void the recipe if there's nowhere to put the output. So we're going to use that to our advantage here. And now we can assign the fluid P2Ps. This one is going to be acetone. And the acetone here, uh, unlike some of the other fluids, we're actually not going to send into fluid storage. So we're actually going to create the input P2P for it here. And the reason for that is because, unlike the other fluids, we actually don't need acetone anywhere else. Oh, you know what? Actually, looking through this, we need it for, uh... <laughs> we need it for... We need it for this mess down here. But we're not going to worry about that right now. We're just going to direct P2P. And we'll set up fluid storage for it later on. CO2 gas, though, we will connect to main fluid storage, which I believe is highlighted over there. And now we just have two left, epichlorohydrin and epoxid. Well guys, we did it. <laughs> we have epoxid. Check this out. It's in, of course, the last LC. It's a, it's a little bit strange that we have 856. Doesn't it give you this one bucket at a time? The rest, I must have pointed the fluid hatch um, and disabled the output. Hold on, is there also an uneven amount in the fluid tank? 6,000 epoxid. Wait, how did that happen? How did we lose, like, there's a zombie in the wall as well. That's no good. Yeah, yeah, we're going to fill this in. Can't have holes in the wall. So why was all of this so important? Why did we need epoxy? I just realized, by the way, the epoxy color matches the walls. That's super, like, look at that. That's so perfect. <laughs> Along with the naphtha and the light fuel, etc., which is still running like a champion. Yeah, these distillation towers have been running like crazy here. And I suspect we're actually, yeah, the carbon drawer, we have 28 stacks of carbon, that's like free carbon right there. And a lot of these things are getting very... Oh yeah, look at that. Look at how much propane we've got now. How much methane gas, how much benzene. This is like free benzene. <laughs> yeah, refinery gas. Uh, sulfuric acid, which we're going to need here actually for the epoxy. Naphthenic acid, look at all this stuff. We're getting like 
so much of this. Anyway, I'm getting a bit sidetracked here. <laughs> we still have a little bit left to do, which I would like to explore with you guys, uh, just to finish off this episode. It's been a little bit of a different style of episode today. Let me know if you guys enjoy this kind of style. We'll do this every now and then when we have to deep dive into some chemistry and whatnot. So yeah, just a brief rundown of the epichlorohydrin recipe. So this takes a water input. We, we're just using a reservoir underneath with a dedicated input hatch. Very easy to supply water. This is also one case where circuit 23 actually beats out circuit 24. Circuit 24 is definitely viable here, but the difference is you can either use hypochlorous acid or you just use four buckets of chlorine and water. And to me, this 23 is actually easier since it skips an LCR for making hydro hypochlorous acid. So yeah, that's the reason why I chose circuit 23 over 24 in this specific scenario. This is one of the few exceptions. But the epichlorohydrin and the epoxid also give you salt water as a byproduct. And the salt water actually comes out of an output hatch on the backside and goes straight into an electrolyzer. This is MV. So salt water is one of those situations you just have to decide on what you want to do with. It's also, it is used in the plat line, but that's as far as I can see the only place that salt water is actually needed. And plat line, by the way, is all of this stuff up here. Yeah, I decided for the salt water just to electrolyze it all back into the chlorine, and that lets us recycle the chlorine. We get all of the sodium hydroxide back, both for the epoxid, the six here, and also for the epichlorohydrin, the three here. It's all fully recyclable. So we actually share the input bus for the, for the sodium hydroxide here. So it all comes out of the electrolyzer and goes into the input bus, and that's shared between these two LCRs. And then when you electrolyze salt water, you also get a, a cell of hydrogen and a bucket of chlorine. The cell of hydrogen is passed between some conveyor modules. That passes the full cell into the tank. And then the tank has a, a pump on the side to push it into the hydrogen P2P. And that goes back into main fluid storage. And then we have the same on the opposite side for chlorine. Only this one we can use fluid automatic output. And then we can also just put a pump on the side of this tank. And that should export all of the chlorine back into fluid P2P and back into fluid storage. Yeah, and because we have the pump on there, it's a one-way system because we have block input. So that means that the chlorine can only go one way, and that is this way. <laughs> it's not a direction, but uh, yeah, you know what I mean. I suppose the only other thing worth mentioning here is the epichlorohydrin actually points straight into the input hatch here for epoxid. Like this. So there, there's, these are like two hatches touching each other. And that's just a very convenient way to avoid having to pipe it into the next LCR, especially when they're right next to each other like this. However, we are still missing one important thing. You guys remember when I said I had a plan? I had a plan for the hydrochloric acid here. How do we manage fluid priorities? Well, we have some new tools uh, in this version of the pack actually, which did not exist in the previous version of GTNH. And before we get into this, I'm not 100% sure if this is going to work, but we will see, we will see. I've been making up some workstations here, some EV circuits. So we all know about the fluid detector covers, right? Well, it turns out there's actually a wireless fluid detector cover, but this thing costs an EV emitter for one. So yeah, that's a GTNH recipe right there. <laughs> so this will be able to send us a redstone signal based on the fluid amount from fluid storage. And then we need some way to receive that at the hydrochloric acid LCR. So for that, there's something called the Advanced Redstone Receiver. And this costs an EV circuit plus the receiver, which is an, an EV sensor. <laughs> so there's one of those as well. Oh my goodness, this is so expensive. Oh, nice. And that is also a quest. You're going to hate this. So these have to go through the assembly machine. I noticed, by the way, it's like a 160 second recipe. That was an MV though. Yeah, EV is only 40 seconds. That's not too bad. And you know what? Since we're waiting on some assembler recipes, I actually went ahead and crafted the replacement coils for this blast furnace. I definitely wanted to make sure to do that before the end of the episode. Okay, so we have our... Wait, wait a second. What did I just make there? Player detector cover gives out close players as reds. This is not... Oh, I don't believe... <laughs> I think that just ate our sensor. We must have had the wrong circuit number, right? Or maybe just conflicting recipes. I don't think I put in a stainless steel plate in there. Well, I guess we're going to have to make another one. Okay, the assembler is crafting again. Hopefully it's the right recipe this time. Okay, so how does this work? I'm assuming it's going to be on some sort of frequency system. Actually, let's go over to fluid storage first. And we're going to find hydrochloric acid here. We're going to need some way to mark these things. I'm not exactly sure what the best method to do that is. 
It would be nice to know what is stored in here though, in these tanks. Although I guess eventually we're going to have applied energistics terminals. Anyway, we're going to put the wireless fluid detector cover on the bottom. And let's see what this does. Okay, fluid threshold. Let's see if we're below 32 buckets. Because it is a fast recipe, it's like only a few seconds in the LCR to make more. The frequency, maybe we can use the frequency uh, that's corresponding to the item ID. So you can see on the tooltip there, it's 7197. That kind of makes sense to me, right? 7197. Seven, seven, Private, I'm assuming that's for multiplayer. And then inverted. Okay, so then I'm assuming we can put the receiver on the LCR. Now, does it go on the machine controller or does it go on the output hatch? Because we are still measuring this fluid detector cover, but that won't need to be the case if we always have space for it. Because we're effectively ensuring that is the case if we uh, obey the frequency that 7917 or whatever it was. So yeah, let's actually take this one off of here and we'll instead put the receiver on the output hatch and then 7191. Oh wait, we have to be very careful there. I thought it was 7191, but that is actually the item ID of the hydrochloric acid cell and that is different to the fluid. So we want it as the fluid 97. 97, so now it should turn on. Or stay off, sorry, because we have over 32 buckets of hydrochloric acid. And just for testing purposes, let's actually change the frequency back to something uh, we're not using. Okay, this seems to be pretty intuitive. I can kind of guess how this is going to work. And we definitely have over 32 buckets here. Let's change this up to 320 buckets, which we definitely don't have here. Then if we go change the frequency back, it should turn the machine back on. And if so, I think we can call this pretty good, right? Right? Machine? Yeah. <laughs> Why doesn't this work? Okay, I noticed there was actually an advanced version. I'm not sure if that makes a difference. I mean, it costs us an extra circuit, so I hope this works. There it is. Success. I got it to 7197. If we change it to 191, it should turn off. After the recipe. It doesn't turn off. Oh, we got it. Nice. Okay, I, I, think, I, I think what it was is you have to use analog mode. There's a bunch of extra features in here, like AND gates, NAND gates, OR gates, and NOR gates. That is going to come in pretty useful if we want to measure multiple different tanks. Right, so we could, for example, uh, I don't know, measure the hydrochloric acid output bus here. It's not necessary because we're always going to ensure we have space in main fluid storage. But yeah, that could be useful if we use the AND gate. Let's just double check to make sure this turns off if we go back and set the threshold. If we set this back down to 32 buckets, we shouldn't see any more arrive here. 129, and it stays on 129. It's only a three second recipe, so it should have came in by now. It seems to be working though, right? I don't know how many times I've ran back and forward, but yes, it works. <laughs> it works, oh my goodness, finally. And yeah, we can just basically turn all of this back on. And I've decided that we're just gonna let the acetic acid fill up. I mean, we'll use it eventually, right? And then everything else, of course, the epoxid. Nice, we're gonna be building this up for next episode, where we should be able to get access to the epoxid circuit boards and then the epoxy and nano processors. Yeah, HV, EV, and IV circuits. Oh, and LUV circuits even. But yeah, hopefully I didn't mess anything with this setup. Again, I wanna make sure these are, these are basically as polished as we can make them for the time being. And I think we achieved that. Let me know what you think about the yellow design here. And that is also going to wrap up today's episode. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it all the way to the end again. Have an awesome day, and I'll see you all in the next episode of New Horizons.